Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Shafi Nambiya wal Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim In last week's lesson We were looking at those people who persecuted Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who humiliated Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who mocked and hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in the case of Nazar bin Harith, who ridiculed the verses of the Holy Quran by comparing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the words of historians, by saying that Muhammad, he is narrating the stories of Ad and Samud, and I am going to narrate the stories of the Persian kings and the Persian scholars. On top of that, Nazar bin Harith, he also purchased and brought slave girls who would sing and mock the words of the Holy Quran and it is through women and music Nazar bin Haris he diverted people away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he diverted the people away from the qualities and from the attributes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and more importantly, in this case, he diverted people away from the blessed words and the blessed verses of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now, as I mentioned before, that the persecution of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the taunting, the humiliation of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He wasn't connected to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam only, but this persecution and this taunting and humiliation also spread to the blessed companions and to the blessed Sahabas of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And to a certain extent the difficulties and the persecutions which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was going through was less compared to the difficulties and the persecutions the Sahabas and the companions were going through. The reason why is because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was from the Quraysh, he was from the Banu Hashim. He at that time had his uncle Abu Talib, his wife Khadija al Anha was also from a very noble family. So what happened was that the people, the Quraysh, the pagans of Mecca, they would persecute Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but they would do it more under the sly. They would do more like in the background. When Abu Talib would not be there, then they would throw some pebbles at Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They would try to hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But when Abu Talib would be around, when the other members of the Banu Hashim tribe would be around, then no pagan of Mecca had the tenacity, had the ability to do anything to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But when he came to certain companions and certain Sahabas. Like Hazrat Bilal radhiyallahu anhu, and as we can look at later, Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir radhiyallahu anhu, because they had no family members in Mecca, because they had no wali or no guardians in Mecca, because they had no helpers and no assistants in Mecca, what would happen is that the pagans of Mecca, the mushrikeen, the idol worshippers, they would show their brutality and they force on these weak companions and on these weak Sahabas. 
Now I'm just going to mention the story for the persecution of two Sahabas and two companions. If you were to open the books of Sirah, then you will be able to see and you will be able to read so many companions, the difficulties, the hardships, the humiliation, the persecution, the taunts they went through. But Hazrat Bilal anhu and Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir anhu, they went through the most persecution, they went through the most difficulty and the hardship for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the sake and cause of Islam and for the sake of the Iman and the belief. Now, Hazrat Bilal anhu was from Ethiopia which in those days was called Abyssinia. He was of a dark complexion and he was the slave of Umayyah bin Khalf. Now when Hazrat Bilad al Anhu accepted Islam, Umayyah bin Khalf in the mid-afternoon when the heat of the sun would be at its most fiercest, and the sand of the desert would turn blazing hot, Umayyah would then direct his servants to make Hazrat Bilal anhu lie flat down on the hot baking sand. They would then put a massive stone or a rock on his chest to restrict his movement and they would let Hazrat Bilad anhu lie down in that state with his back on the hot baking sand, on the hot desert sand and Umayyah bin Khalf would then say, say to Hazrat Bilad anhu that Bilal denounce Muhammad and believe in our God. Denounce Muhammad, denounce your belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in Lat al Uzza, believe in our God. Now in these trying and testing times, Hazrat Bilal al Anhu did not let go of the religion. He did not say, okay Umayyah, I believe in what you are saying or I believe in your God. He did not say that. But instead, in these testing and difficult times, he kept on saying, Ahad, Ahad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And the moral which we can gather from this particular story is that whenever in our lives, whenever we are going through any testing and any kind of difficult situation, we should never ever forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should never ever forget the words and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but instead difficult times, tribulations and hardships should be a cause and a means for us to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when we look through the books of hadith, like your Sunan Abu Dawood, like your Sunan Tirmidhi, like your Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it tells us that whenever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would be faced with any hardships, or whenever, say for example, something unusual has happened in terms of a solar eclipse, in terms of all of a sudden the day becoming dark, and so on and so forth, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would hasten towards Salah, would hasten towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would hasten and encourage the companions in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in fulfilling the words and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So exactly here as well, whenever we go through any difficulties, we should think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. But unfortunately what happens nowadays is that whenever we go through any difficulties, the last person and the last thing we think about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever we in a difficulty, we look for the low, 
the nearest imam or the local imam or the local scholar and we ask him for a taweez, we ask him for you know, du'as, we ask him for this and that, we ask him can he help us out, can he help us out. But instead, whenever we are in difficulties, first and foremost, our port of call should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So exactly as well, regarding Hazrat Bilal ibn Anhu, when he was going through some difficulty, he did not give up his religion, he did not give up his iman, but instead he kept on saying, Ahad, Ahad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And just on the side, I'll just mention another ruling here. And that is that it is mentioned in the books of fiqh. That if someone, say for example, is forced to give up his religion. Somebody points a gun to your head. Somebody puts a knife near your neck. And he says that give up your religion, otherwise I will kill you. So it's mentioned in the books of fiqh that in that situation it is permissible for a person to denounce his religion and say the words of kufr, say that he believes in someone besides Allah, say that he believes in a prophet besides Rasulullah sallam. He will be allowed to say that verbally as long as وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ iman, as long as his heart is, uh, as long as his heart believes in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believes in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if in that difficult and trying and testing situation, if he was to say the kalima kufr, it would be allowed, it would be permissible. However, the scholars have also gone on to say that if he did sabr, law sabara hatta kutila. He did sabr, he was patient, and he said that, no, I'm not going to say kalimai kufar. I'm not going to say that I don't believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or I don't believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that I believe in your gods, and that I believe in Lat and Uzza. So it's mentioned in the books of fiqh, that law sabra hatta kutila, then that person, yakunu majuran, yakunu shahidan, that such a person will be, and if he was to get killed, then such a person will be considered a martyr, such a person will be considered rewarded in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving up his life, for sacrificing his life for the sake of Allah and for the sake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is what we can see from the story of Hazrat Bilal anhu that he wasn't forced in that situation to actually go through the difficulties. If he wanted, he could have actually said, oh, Umayyah, I believe in your God, I believe in Lat and Uzza. But no, he took the punishment, he took the difficulty, he took the persecution for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith which can be found in Ibn Sa'd Tabaqat, it mentioned that sometimes Umayyah bin Khalf would make Hazrat Bilal al Anhu wear an armor suit and then he would make him lie down on the hot desert sun of Arabia now a suit made out of armor if somebody was to wear a suit made out of armor the suit itself is very very hot hot in terms of like you start sweating you start boiling inside so imagine Umayyah making Hazrat Bilal al who wear one of these suits and then top of that would then make him lie down on the hot sun, on the hot desert, desert sand and he could imagine the, the difficulty, the anxiety, the stress Hazrat Bilal al who going through whilst in that particular suit of armour his body is kind of burnt. But even then, he never gave up Iman. He kept on saying, Ahad, Ahad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. In another narration, which can be found in Ibn Sa'd's Tabaqat, it mentioned that sometimes Umayyah, he would tell some young boys, young children, to tie a rope around the neck of Hazrat Bilal al-Anhu 
and he would then order these young boys to drag Hazrat Bilal radhiyallahu anhu around the city making fun out of him mocking him but even then Hazrat Bilal radhiyallahu anhu in these difficult situations he would keep on saying ahad ahad allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one now once Hazrat Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu passed by and he witnessed the torture and the persecution of Hazrat Bilal al Anhu first hand. Hazrat Abu Bakr al Anhu then started berating Umayyah, telling Umayyah that look, stop, you know, persecuting this weak and innocent person. He was just he wants to believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then stop persecuting him, stop torturing him. Now Umayyah then turned around and he then said to Hazrat Bakr al-Anhu that it's your fault. I, because you have converted and you have become Muslims and you let go of your forefather's religion, that's why we are torturing him, that's why we are persecuting him. And then Umayyah then said to Abu Bakr anhu that it is now obligatory upon you, i.e. Abu Bakr anhu to free him. So Abu Bakr anhu agreed and he said that I have a strong slave who I will give in return for Hazrat Bilal anhu. Abu Bakr anhu then handed this slave over to Umayyah. Umayyah then handed Hazrat Bilal anhu to Abu Bakr anhu. And then Abu Bakr al Anhu freed him. And it's mentioned that the marks of the torture and the persecution of Hazrat Bilal al Anhu can be seen or can be visible or can was seen clearly on the back of Hazrat Bilal al Anhu whenever his top or whenever his chest or body would get exposed then everyone could see the marks which were visible on Hazrat Bilal al Anhu's back. So that was the story of Hazrat Bilal al Anhu. The next companion which I'm going to look at and the persecutions and the difficulties he went through is the companion named Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir al Anhu. Now, like Hazrat Bilal al Anhu, Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir al Anhu was not originally from the city of Mecca. Hence, he had no family members, he had no tribes, he had no anyone, no assistants, no helpers to help him from any torments and any tortures from the pagans of Mecca. Now, the story of Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir al Anhu is as follows that his father Yasir anhu was from Yemen and he came to Mecca in search of one of his missing brothers that his brother who used to live in Yemen with him disappeared so Hazrat Yasir anhu along with two of his other brothers who were called Haris and Malik they came to Mecca looking for this missing brother. Now, after they, after they searched Mecca and they could not find the missing brother, Haris and Malik returned back to Yemen, whilst Yasir Radhiallahu decided to stay in Mecca. And it's mentioned that Yasir Radhiallahu he made friends with Abu Huzaifa al Makhzumi, and Abu Huzaifa al Makhzumi had a slave girl whose name was Sumayya bint Khayyat and Abu Huzaifa al Makhzumi got Hazrat Yasir al Anhu married to his slave girl Sumayya bint Khayyat and it is from this union or it is from this nikah and marriage Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir al Anhu was born. Now when the call of Islam came and the da'wah and the preaching of Rasulullah became open, Hazrat Yasir al-Anhu 
ஆயுத ஃபாதர் ஹசரத் சுமையா பின் தெஹையாத் ருத்ல அன்ஹா தி மதர் அன் ஹசரத் அம்மா ருத்ல அன்ஹு அன் ஹிஸ் பிரதர் அப்துல்லா பின் யாசிர் ருத்ல அன்ஹு ஆல் இம்ப்ரேஸ்ட் இஸ்லாம் நாஸ் வாஸ் மென்ஷனிங் அபவ் திஸ் நவ் தட் ஹசரத் அம்மா பின் யாசிர் ருத்ல அன்ஹு அன் ஹிஸ் ஃபேமிலி தே ஹட் நோ சப்போர்ட் இன் மக்கா தே வர் லைக் டோட்டல் ஸ்ட்ரேஞ்சர்ஸ் இன் மக்கா நோ ஒன் நியூ தெம் So what happened was that the Quraysh were able to persecute them and were able to inflict all types of punishment and all types of beatings and torture and brutality over them. And like with Hazrat Bilal ibn Anhu I mentioned above they would make Hazrat Ammar bin Yasir ibn Anhu lie in the or on the desert sand on the hot desert sand they would sometimes beat hazra amma bin yasir al anhu to such a extent that he would fall unconscious sometimes they would hurl water over him and sometimes they would make him lie down on blazing coals so these were the difficulties hazra amma bin yasir al anhu was going through and it's mentioned that once rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed by hazra amma bin yasir al anhu he passed his hands over ammar bin yasir al anhu's head and he said ya nar o fire kuni barda wa salaman ala ammar ta become cool bardan wa salaman and safe ala ammar on ammar bin yasir al anhu kama kunti ala ibrahim the same way you were cool and safe on hazrat ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam this was when hazrat amma bin ya when hazrat amma bin ya sid anhu he would be lying down on the desert sand and he would like basically burn his back he could actually you know he would like ripping the skin on his back he was like peeling the skin on his back then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam made this particular dua that the same way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire cool for the ibrahim alayhi salam when he was thrown in because he broke the idols and he was ordered by the king at that time namrud that he should be sent to the fire so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire cool and made it safe for the ibrahim alayhi salam this is the same dua rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is making for hazrat ammar bin yasir bin anhu so that his persecution and his difficulty becomes light and easy for him and it's mentioned also that abu jahal and we talked about abu jahal in last week's lesson he once thrust a spear into the private parts of hazrat sumayya bin tahiyat radhi anha which instantly killed her and she was and she became the first martyr of islam so she was the first person to be martyred she was the first person to be a shahida and someone who martyred and sacrificed their life for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the words ahad ahad that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one for the reason for the sake of the love of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the obedience of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also for to implement the wording the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the obedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hazrat sumayya bin tahiyat became the first shahida and the first martyr in islam now as i mentioned before that the quraysh the pagans of makka they were trying everything within their capacity within their ability and their capability to stop the flow of islam they tried persecuting rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they tried humiliating rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they tried persecuting and humiliating the companions and the sahaba but it did not stop people converting to islam 
in the tens and in the hundreds. Now, approximately five years before the Muslims migrating to Medina Munawwara, the pagans of Mecca they approached Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to show them to exhibit to them some signs and some miracles to prove that he was in fact a true prophet and a true nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago the wisdom regarding Iman bil Ghaib and belief in the unseen and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he doesn't show miracles clear and one of the reasons why is because if Allah was to show something clearly if he was to show Jannah if he was to show paradise if he was to show hell clearly if he was to show something supernatural something amazing then there would be no concept of Iman bil Ghaib. What would happen? Everybody would be believers. Everybody would be religious. Everybody would be pious. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will or something which we call in Arabic Mashiach that he keeps or he kept everything separate in terms of there is Iman, there is also Kufr and disbelief so that a person out of their own will, out of their own accord can accept the path of Allah can accept hidayat and guidance and they can shun misguidance and they can shun polala. Now what happened was the pagans of Makkah which included Walid bin Muhira, Aas bin Wa'il, Aas bin Hisham and so on and so forth they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they demanded a miracle and they demanded in particular for Rasulullah to split the moon into two parts now Rasulullah replied by saying that okay if I was to fulfill what you are demanding me what you are telling me to do would you then believe me to be a prophet and a messenger of Allah? So they all replied by saying, yes, that if you were to split the moon into two, we will definitely believe that you are the true prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the true messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then requested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exhibit this particular miracle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ordered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to direct his blessed finger towards the moon. And the moment when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed towards the moon, the moon split into two. One over Mount Abu Qubais and the second part of the moon over Mount Qayqa'a. Abu Qubais and Mount Qayqa'an they were like two mountains of Mecca so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to put his blessed finger in line with the moon and the moon split into two pieces it's not like and the crack here or the two pieces here it wasn't like a kind of a small kind of uh, gap between the two pieces so people then could you know, reject and say, oh, well, you know, there wasn't a gap there, or I didn't see a gap. The gap or the splitting of the moon was done so clearly, one over one mountain and the other over another mountain. So clearly done so that no one could deny the existence of this particular miracle and the existence of this supernatural thing which was happening in front of their eyes. Now he's mentioned in the books of Hadith that when this miracle happened, people were left dumbfounded. They were in astonishment. They repeatedly wiped their eyes with their hands, with their clothing, 
and they couldn't believe that this was what they were seeing, this was what they were witnessing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to say, Ishadu, bear witness. And it's mentioned in the books of Hadith that the moon splitting into two and the two pieces of the moon, one over Mount Abu Qubais and the other over Mount Qayqa'an, it remained for a time equivalent to the time from Asr to Maghrib. And approximately Asr to Maghrib is around one and a half hours. This is how long the two pieces, one over Abu Qubais, the other over Mount Qayqa'an, remained. Now afterwards, when the two pieces were then put back and it reverted back to its original shape and size, the pagans of Mecca then said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, look everyone, Muhammad has cast a magical spell over us. And what he did, splitting the moon into two pieces, this is not a miracle, this is not something real, but he has done some magic over us, he has done some sihr over us, he has done some kind of spell over our eyes, where to us it seemed as though that they were, the moon was splitting the two, but in reality it wasn't. They themselves then said that when the travelers come to Mecca, or when they enter Mecca, we'll ask the travelers that did they see the moon split into two. Now in Arabia in particular, most of the time they would travel during the night. Very rarely they would travel during the day because it was too hot in the day to travel. So they would travel during the night. Now when the travelers returned or when they arrived or approached Mecca, Muqarrama, they, I, the pages of Mecca, asked the travelers that did you see anything unusual? Did you see the moon split into two? So that all the travelers replied by saying, yes, that we saw the moon being split into two pieces. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran. In Surah Al-Qamar, Chapter 54, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Iqtarabati sa'atu wa nshaq al-Qamar, that the day of judgment is close, wa nshaq al-Qamar, and the moon has split. Wa in yaraw ayatay yu'ridu wa yaqulu sihrun mustamir. And if they, i.e. the pagans of Mecca, was to see a sign, يُعْبِدُوا They would turn their faces away وَيَقُولُوا And they would say سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ That this is a continuous سِحَر This is another form of black, black magic This is a form of magic Which Rasulullah Wasallam has placed over our eyes So that to us it seems as though That the moon has split into two But in reality it hasn't Regarding this particular verse, Iqtarabati Sa'atu wa Nshaq al-Qamar, some scholars of the view that this wa Nshaq al-Qamar, the splitting of the moon, is actually one of the signs of day of judgment. That before the day of judgment, one of the signs is that the moon will split into two pieces. However, the majority of the Mufassirin and the scholars of the Holy Quran and the majority of the commentators of the Holy Quran of the view that no one shaq al-Qamar here is referring to this incident where the pagans of Mecca asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to split the moon into two. Now those who are the deniers of Islam, they turn around and say that, well, this is impossible. How can it be possible for the moon to be split into two pieces? Now, our reply is that that is the whole purpose of a miracle. A miracle or a mu'jiza basically means to bring into existence things which are impossible. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable to do. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do. He brings into existence things which are impossible, things which a man cannot do himself. But this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. Because our belief is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Al-Qadir, He is the All-Powerful. Like with the example of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, 
coming into existence without the means and the cause of the Father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that. Why? Because He is the most powerful. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to split the moon into two, this is something which is very, very easy. Also, some people then turn around and say, well, if, say, for example, this really did happen, the moon split into two pieces, then why is it not mentioned in the books of history? Why is it not mentioned in the books of history, in the books of tarikh, that, you know, such and such a time, the moon was split into two pieces? Now, again, the reply to that is very simple, and that is that many, many strange events has happened in this dunya or in this world. But it is not mentioned in the books of history. What I'm trying to say is that just because it's not mentioned in the books of history, it doesn't mean that these things did not happen. It doesn't mean that these things did not exist. And also at the same time, another reply one can give is that the aim of this particular miracle was to show the people of Mecca was to show the pagans of Mecca the splitting of the moon. So it is possible that the rest of the world did not see the splitting of the moon, but only those people, only the pagans of Mecca, only Wahil bin, uh, Walid bin Mughira, Ask bin Wahil, and someone who requested this particular miracle from Rasulullah only they saw it. And another way to look at it is that it could also be it could also be so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he showed the miracle to the people he showed this miracle to the people of Mecca but for the rest of the world Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he didn't want to show that miracle to them because our belief is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he wants he can put a veil he can put a hijab over people's eyes to such an extent that things which are so clear, people are not willing to accept. And this is similar to the tafsir which I mentioned before, Khatam Allahu ala khulubihim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a veil over the hearts of the uh, pagans of Makkah in terms of any kind of blessings, any kind of you know, uh, information about the deen and the religion. They are unwilling to accept or listen to you. Why? Because Allah had put a veil over their heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made their heart hard and strong that they are unable to accept anything. So similarly here as well, that what could have happened is that saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have shown the people of Makkah this particular miracle, but for the rest of the world, for the rest of the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make it visible for them. Because remember, the visibility of something depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and mashiach. And this is just generally, that is our belief anyway. That whatever happens in this dunya, for us to see, for us to hear, for us to smell, and so on and so forth, we believe that this is all down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and mashiach. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say for example, doesn't want this miracle to be seen by others besides the people of Makkah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that, as I mentioned before, because he is al-Qadid, he is the most powerful, and he can do whatever he wants. We leave it here for this week, and like the speed, so if you track to us, we said, وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ لِحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ